It is time to talk Monday Night Raw that occurred on March 14th, 2022. We're going to get into everything that happened, including the very quick tribute to Scott Hall, a tearful reaction by Corey Graves. Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins battle it out as Seth continues to try to find his path to WrestleMania. We'll talk about why that doesn't make any sense. Becky Lynch returns. Commander Aziz and Omas go at it in a absolute classic. Can you hear the sarcasm? Let's get it all going right now. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Says I just your ass. This is my honor. You're going to acknowledge me. WrestleMania is just two and a half weeks away as I record this on a Wednesday. Normally, I do not record this this late. However, I am uh, doing some other things this week, including traveling. But that won't mean any interruption in your shows. It just means that this was a little bit late. The mailbag will be coming later today as well. But that also means you need to get in your questions and voicemails as quickly as possible. You can send them at mailbag at WWPodcast.com or to our voicemail at 518-952-0247. If you want to leave a voicemail, you have up to three minutes to do so. But let's just jump into Monday Night Raw, guys. Let's, let's do it here as we are two and a half weeks away from WrestleMania and how quickly this comes, right? My God, uh, only two weeks left of TV before the big event. And Monday Night Raw seemed to center around who's going to host Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? Who's, who's going to be the host to his show or to his um, appearance, essentially. And Rollins said he could come up with a uh, some kind of talk show. And Kevin Owens was not approving. And Seth proposed a match. And then whoever wins that match would host Stone Cold Steve Austin. And uh, Sonya Deville then approved that. Uh, she approved that uh, that idea, and Seth and Kevin Owens had a had a match, and Kevin Owens won predictably, and Seth went back into deep depression, and it it does make you wonder where they're really going with Seth here because I think for the next week or two, maybe the next final two weeks of TV before WrestleMania, they're probably going to continue this theme with Seth that he comes up with an idea, and he's got it, and he's out of depression, and then he. It ends up falling flat on its face before Raw is over. And he continues to slide deeper and deeper into depression. Every idea he has fails. And it makes you wonder, where does it leave Seth? And I believe that he won't have a quote-unquote path to WrestleMania. We're going to talk about that, by the way, in a a moment. But I think that at the the final go-home show for Raw going into WrestleMania... I believe that is going to be Seth Rollins with no quote unquote plan or path to WrestleMania and he doesn't have anything to do. And that's how I think it's going to be left. And we'll have to see what he actually does at WrestleMania. I mean, that is going to be, I believe the talking point going into WrestleMania beyond the matches that we're going to have to predict and the stone cold KO segment. That's a match. That's not really a match, but it's a segment. It's going to be a fight. We don't know what the hell it's going to be. Um, I believe that it's going to also be a talking point, a big talking point of, well, where does Seth fit into all this? Where does, who does he screw over? Who does he, what match does he interfere in? Does he just come out and start complaining? And then he has somebody come out and, and debut, uh, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to leave him laying or something like that, or to confront Seth. Maybe, maybe it's, I believe it's a huge setup for Seth while it's, it's on TV being portrayed as a, you know, a, a travesty that Seth doesn't have anything going on for WrestleMania. I believe that it's actually a good thing because it's leading to something big you would hope for Seth. This is leading to something big for Seth Rollins. I just don't know exactly what that is yet. And I don't think he'll have anything going into WrestleMania, which will leave the door wide open for speculation about interference in a match that he could he could do or against somebody debuting, um, debuting against him. And, you know, we'll see. I mean, I could be wrong. In the final week, we could have a matchup of, of I don't know, hell, Tommaso Ciampa versus uh, Seth Rollins. So um, let's get into the, the the one thing I have an issue with, and that is this idea, this narrative that WWE has been pushing across both brands, that if you don't have a match 
scheduled, or if you're not a champion that you are that you don't have a path to WrestleMania, that you just you simply can't go to WrestleMania. Now, h- how exactly that makes sense, I don't know, because every other pay per view in the history of pay per views, this is not a thing. This is not a narrative that they push. That if you're you're not on the car, that you can't appear, because every other pay per view ever has shown that you don't need to be quote unquote scheduled to be on the show. You could just do whatever you want. And even Randy Orton this week said that now that he and Riddle have become the raw tag team champions, that they have a path to WrestleMania, something to that effect that essentially they can go to WrestleMania, that they have a path they can appear. Well, then he turns around and rejects the idea of a match with the street profits who challenged them to a match at WrestleMania. So I'm thinking to myself, well, Randy, you just said that the reason you can go to WrestleMania is to is because you are champion, and yet you're rejecting a match that would put you on the card because you're champion. It doesn't. It made no sense. So let me just kind of dive deeper into this. I mean, Seth Rollins' whole story, and I, I don't, I don't hate it. I think it's interesting to see where they're going to go with this, assuming they have a long term plan. God willing is that Seth's path WrestleMania doesn't exist because he doesn't have a match. He doesn't have something scheduled ahead of time. And, and like, I understand that on a very surface level. But th- the problem with that is you are now undercutting what professional wrestling is or what it's supposed to be. And what Vince has told us it is, is that it's this environment where anything can happen at any time. Hell, we have the announcers tell us that almost on a weekly basis that you never know what could happen. Anything could happen at any time. That's the feeling that you should get and that they tell us we should feel, even though they don't really they don't really manifest that feeling. A lot of times it just feels very structured. You know how matches are going to end. You know when they're going to commercial break. You know when interference is usually going to happen. Like If anything, it's quite the opposite, and yet they're always trying to drive the narrative home. And Maybe if they say it enough times, we'll believe it. That's just, It's an environment where anything can happen. I mean... It was back in the Attitude Era and Ruthless Aggression Era and some even bled a little bit into the PG Era. But as a whole, it's not an environment, despite what they tell us over and over, that you really feel that anything could happen at any time. Very rarely do you get that feeling. And yet they continue to tell us that. Fine. So that's the narrative they're driving. And I understand why. I have no problem with that. But here's the problem is that, okay, if that's the narrative you're driving, if that's the if that's the message, oh, I said the, buzz, key, uh, the, the corporate buzzword, <laughs> God, they killed that word on on Raw again this week. But that's the message they're trying to send to fans. Fine. I'll take that at face value. Now, Seth Rollins is having a problem getting to WrestleMania because he doesn't have a a match, right? He doesn't have a match. He doesn't have anything going on. He's depressed. But if this is an environment where anything can happen at any time, why does Seth have to have something scheduled to do something big? Because you're told that this is an unpredictable environment. Things can just happen. Well, why couldn't Seth just all of a sudden interfere in the Brock Lesnar Roman Reigns match? Just turn into a triple threat. Why doesn't he just show up on SmackDown because the brand rules don't apply and just challenge them both? Why doesn't he do that? People are showing up all the time. Austin Theory's on that show for no reason. Big E was traded for no reason. Uh, I mean, why couldn't he do that? He has unfinished business with Roman Reigns. I mean, I don't think he will do that. But my point is that if this is an environment where anything could happen, all you have to do is like think for five seconds and rub a couple of brain cells together to figure out like, okay, I could just do anything I want, right? Who's going to stop me? I can interfere in the main event. I could call out somebody. I could I could attack Stone Cold during the KO segment. I mean, there's a million and one things that he could do. And again, it's, it's to me, they're, they're boxing themselves in by saying he has to have a match at WrestleMania. Or he has to have something scheduled to be on the show. That's not a thing. Like if talent don't have a match or a scheduled segment, what bars them from going to the show? Or uh, is management going to make sure that you know security are surrounding the building to to uh, check to see? Okay, you have a match. You can get in. You don't have a segment. You have to stay out. Sorry, you can't come to the show tonight. You have, you're banned from the building. No, of course not. So I it's just to me, I, I don't know. Anybody else have this problem? Like it doesn't make sense. And then Randy Orton rejects the very thing that he said that the titles afford him is going to WrestleMania, and yet then he rejects a match that would put him on the card. What? <laughs> it's just, I, I, I really, I reject this narrative outright that, that that we have to have something scheduled to be on the show, or you have to have a path to WrestleMania. You just do what you want because that's the environment we're told that this 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 world of pro wrestling is. 
So I don't know. Uh, I have a big problem with that whole thing. And, and everybody's using it, right? It's not just Randy. It's not just Seth. It's not Kevin Owens. It's everyone that they, if they somehow have a match or an, or, an, or an, a title that they are automatically afforded a path to WrestleMania as if they can't just do whatever the hell they want. So anyway, I'll get off that soapbox and I'll welcome you guys to the WWE podcast. Thank you for joining me here. A bit of a long intro there, but I have a, a real problem with that narrative. Um, and again, thank you for everybody for joining us here. We, we have a, a great, uh, a, a great lineup coming to you over the next couple of weeks with pro wrestling, including AEW NXT reviews and, and, uh, the, the, the big build up to WrestleMania. We're going to have a massive preview and prediction show. Of course, probably a multi-day, uh, review show as WrestleMania is cut into two days, but it's going to probably last a full week of reviews. I mean, like after WrestleMania, there's probably going to be like three, four shows of reviews with not just myself, but co-hosts that uh, come on and we discuss what happened and what could have happened and the good and the bad and the ugly. So that's going to be a lot of fun over the next few weeks as WrestleMania is my God, two and a half weeks away, as I said. So um, I'd also enjoy invite you to join us ad free. If you hate these ads, you can get rid of them for a dollar over on Apple Podcasts. Actually, 99 cents on Apple Podcasts. If you click that ad free button, there's a special going right now through WrestleMania. It's 99 cents for a month or $10 for the entire year. That's two months for free if you do the math. And uh, that, that's less than one month of a subscription to Netflix. I mean, it's like half of one month. <laughs> so um, just putting it in perspective and you don't have to listen to any ads ever and you get every show ad free uh, as well as on Patreon. You get a dollar gets you in the door and a shout out on the show and you get to join us on the discord server and every hundreds of shows ad free. Or finally, you can join us on our website at www.podcast.com. I have three exclusive video updates on there talking about Stone Cold's return. Uh, I talked about um, the uh, what was it? Uh, oh, my behind the scenes of my office that I have and you get to see exactly what my setup looks like here at the WWE podcast studios. Sounds like, sounds cool. Doesn't it? Yeah. That's hardly a thing. I mean, I'm in my house in a small room in an office. <laughs> that's the reality of things. Um, but I invite you to join us there because uh, on my website, you can go VIP and get all our shows ad free as well as those video updates that I do from time to time. And you can get 50% off right now by using code WrestleMania, which means only a dollar 50 a month on our website. Pretty damn cool. So, all right, let's jump into more about Monday Night Raw here. And I'm going to use CBS Sports as a guide for the show because I I think they do a nice job and it's nice to compare my thoughts with theirs. So I already talked about a little bit about uh, Seth and Kevin, but I want to dive into the match they had at the end of the show. So Kevin Owens beat Seth with a stunner. And here is what CBS Sports said. They said the match saw high-level action from two men who have been rivals many times in the past, both scoring several near falls before Owens was able to hit a stunner and pick up the win, who secured his spot as Austin's host at WrestleMania. Rollins was left despondent despondent once again, realizing he has no spot on the show, uh, the biggest show of the year. And they, they said this, the match was very good as expected. Still, it's hard to get too excited for a match where the stakes are, quote, winner hosts a talk show. Yeah, that's true. In fact, the idea that WWE can't just can't find a spot at WrestleMania for its two top stars and most proven stars, despite their situation, dominating the weekly television show has always been ridiculous. Still, a very solid match between two men who have established tons of chemistry over the years. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I don't always agree with CBS Sports on their takes here. I would have to agree with this. They gave this grade a B or the, the match a B. Totally agree with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's amazing that, that the two top stars on the show that don't even have an established match on the show that you would hope was built for months and months. I mean, remember, I predicted, as many of you did too, that and hoped that a few months back, that Seth Rollins would be the one to win the WWE title at WrestleMania. Remember that whole thing? Yeah, I remember that. And now we're talking about Seth fighting to host a talk show. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Now, again, the payoff to Seth here could be worth it, but I have no faith in WWE for their their booking, especially long-term. When I say long-term, to them, long-term is like more than a week out. So I'm a little bit nervous for Seth, but I'm hopeful they have something in store for him. But I totally agree with CBS Sports on their take here. So let's see here. I'm moving on here. Um, Damian Priest defeated Finn Balor via pinfall with reckoning. Austin Theory was on commentary for the match, unfortunate or ultimately drawing enough of Balor's attention to allow Priest to score the win. After the match, Theory hit Balor with an ATL. 
Okay. So, yeah, Damian Priest continues his heel run, not exactly on fire, but makes sense, as well as Austin Theory on commentary and uh, distracting distracting Balor enough to hit the ATL and, or have him lose the match and then lay him out and take his selfies. I think this is leading to Finn Balor helping Pat McAfee win his match against Austin Theory, and then ultimately Finn Balor and Austin Theory go into a longer program after WrestleMania. That's probably where they're going because I don't think Pat McAfee loses his match at WrestleMania. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, not that I think it's going to be a good match at all. I really doubt it. I, mean, I don't know how it can be a good match. But I think Finn Balor helps him win. That's my guess. That seems to be what they're setting up for. Okay, Omas versus Commander Aziz. Man, you, 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 know, you look at this and you would have thought a few months back, like, okay, that would actually be a matchup that I'd be semi-interested in, kind of lukewarm to see, given the size of Commander Aziz, who is, is no doubt, the biggest opponent for Omas to date. You're thinking, okay, maybe it'll be a challenge. Maybe they'll turn this into something semi-interesting. Instead, this was a three-minute just mashup of, again, Omas doing a little bit of selling, but mostly doing what he's done for the last several months is just beating somebody dominantly never taking a finish and doing his big scary face and roaring and uh, hitting a choke bomb for the victory. That's it. That's it. Um, so here's what uh, CBS Sports says. They said he won with a choke bomb. Omas then pulled Apollo Crews into the ring and hit him with a choke slam after the match had concluded. So boy, Apollo Crews has fallen. Remember last year? Remember last year's WrestleMania with Big E? How good that was? That was one of the most interesting storylines and most overachieving storylines, I think, of last year's WrestleMania going into the show. And now he is being relegated to just uh, essentially collateral damage for Omos. I don't know what Omos's path to WrestleMania is, by the way. Has anybody asked that? What exactly is he doing? I would imagine winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal and making his big, mean, scary face, I think. Probably standing there, crossing his arms like the statue because everyone has to do that. Or the trophy, rather. I mean, I, I don't know. It's I, I don't know what uh, WrestleMania has in store for Omos. Probably not a lot, considering he's still very limited in the ring, it, it appears. All right. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about, it wasn't the next thing on the show, but um, while it's in my mind before I forget... They then did a tribute, WWE did, uh, to Scott Hall. Now, they opened the show with their typical, you know, rest in peace and their, their the, the, the date that he was born, the year he was born, the year he died, you know, that thing in, in loving memory, that kind of thing. But then they actually did a small tribute for a few minutes, a video package quickly put together by WWE. And uh, Corey Graves actually got choked up. That seemed legit. And, um, you know, I it's weird to see Corey Graves in that state where he's close to tears. But it just shows you that this is um this is it's it is a tight knit family, you know. And Scott Hall has had his demons in the past. I mean, we are very well documented with with uh, painkillers and alcohol. And DDP helped him along with Jake the Snake Roberts, and it, it seemed that uh, he was on the road to recovery. And I, I've said this before, but I'll, I'll continue to admit it. I thought when I saw Scott Hall on life support that he had OD'd on something he relapsed into drug use or something and that's not the case as we all know it was a heart attack three heart attacks from a blood clot that resulted from a hip surgery obviously uh, and so um you know but it was it was kind of interesting to see Corey graves in, in that state and anytime you see these moments it brings you back to reality like it snaps you back into reality and um it, it's just i don't know it's, it's a it's it's one of those heartfelt moments it wasn't manufactured clearly I don't think Corey Graves was faking that kind of lip quiver he did. It made you feel something. And um, yeah, I, I feel for Scott Hall's family, you know, for, for all his friends. And they'll, they'll clearly do, I, I don't know how they don't, do a, um, a really nice video package, a more in-depth one maybe next week on Raw, or they'll release it on WWE, um, their YouTube channel, <clears throat> excuse me, or on uh, the, the WWE Network on Peacock, they'll probably do a more in-depth gathering interviews. What did Scott Hall mean? Tell us some stories, you know, that kind of thing. Probably Corey Graves will have maybe Kevin Nash on his uh, his After the Bell podcast at some point. I mean, you don't want to do this stuff like right now. It's a little bit insensitive. But uh, you know, once the 
the grieving period, whatever that is, has passed, I would imagine that they start gathering people together to, to put a nice documentary to, to, together. And uh, admittedly, um, I was talking with Anthony DeMarco on our seg- our show on Monday that we did, which was, by the way, Current State of WWE Part 2. And I had said that you know I, I feel like I need to educate myself more on the contributions that Scott Hall made to the business. Because as I was watching wrestling, as I started to watch wrestling, he was on the, the rival brand, WCW. <clears throat> and I didn't really follow WCW. I knew who the NWO was. I knew who Scott Hall was. But until he came to WWE, I didn't really pay attention because I was all WWE all the time, wasn't a WCW guy at all. And so um, I really think that while I know his career, because we can all review it now, I haven't really dove deep into it. And I feel like I want to now because he was such a massive asset and a completely um, change the game kind of, kind of guy. He, he made it cool to be bad. And his uh, speech that he had at uh, his Hall of Fame induction ceremony where he said, and this will forever be, forever be a probably a staple and the first thing you think of when you hear the name Scott Hall now because it was such a, it's a moment that you don't know is going to be big until it's passed and then you go back on it. And that was his quote that they continue to drive home, which is awesome. It's such a great quote is that bad times don't last, but bad guys do. And it's so great. It's so great. And Kevin Owens did a little bit of a tribute at the beginning of raw. If you remember, he opened the show and said, Hey, yo, and the crowd didn't really do anything to that. I don't think they either expected it. Didn't know what to do. He's also a heel. So are you going to cheer? That is a little weird as far as like the crowd reaction. I applaud Kevin. Kevin even um, Kevin even said backstage when he was talking with Seth, he did another pun or um, a kind of a, an homage to Kevin o- or to Scott Hall when he said something. I forget what it was. Something about bad times don't last. He 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 quoted that in a different way, and so Kevin Owens was the guy to uh, bring that into the forefront on Raw, and I thought, was, I thought it was a nice touch, even if it was from a heel. So uh, you know, look, Scott Hall rest in peace and i'm sure we'll talk more about him in the future and looking forward to whatever whatever they put together whenever they can whenever it's appropriate and uh that the time has passed enough where you could put something really nice together i mean video package you could video packages you could do all day and i'm sure they'll do a much more in-depth one again maybe next week i hope not just the kind of the quick one that they had to do given that they just learned like hours prior he had actually died um, but rather uh, a more in-depth one. But uh, it's also one one kind of unrelated side note about Kevin Owens and, and Stone Cold. I got to say, it's really hard to hate Kevin Owens because he's so talented. And when you have Kevin Owens in a position where you have to hate him, it's difficult, which also makes it hard. I mean, Stone Cold is the ultimate baby face. I mean, he's the biggest baby face of all time. I mean, the biggest in, in any industry, in any company, at any time in, in the history of pro wrestling. But I would say that it's it's hard to hate Kevin in this scenario. Like, man, I still want to see him get his ass kicked, but there's not that like gut level hatred. As maybe if Seth was doing this, I'd I'd feel a little bit different. Um, or if he was actually in a match against, say, Brock Lesnar, and Brock Lesnar was a heel, or he was facing Roman Reigns. Like, if it was a, a somebody that I was easily hateable, I think it would be more accepting for me to want to see that him get pummeled. But I don't know. Does anybody else have this struggle where Kevin Owens is not exactly the the guy that you would want in a position to counter Austin in terms of heel babyface, because Kevin is so likable and he's so he's kind of the everyman and he's so loose on the mic and all that kind of stuff. So it's I got to say it's a little it's a little weird for me from that perspective to uh, to really hate Kevin Owens. I don't hate him. I mean Austin could stun my grandmother. Um, I don't my grandmother's dead, but <laughs> I mean that kind of metaphorically. I mean, but even if he stunned my grandmother, I'd probably still cheer. Right? I mean he's it's just so much fun. Um, but anyway, anyway, okay. I'm getting myself in trouble now. All right. Um, and by the way, guys, if you hear a baby crying in the background, I apologize. I'm trying to talk over it. So if you hear it in the background, like, what's that noise? Is that a baby crying? Yeah, it is. It's, it's nap time for the baby and my wife's taking care of her. So, um, I'll try to talk over it. I I don't have time to do this later. So we're going to have to get through it together. Here we go. All right. So the next thing I have on my list here, Liv Morgan defeats Queen Zelina after hitting oblivion. Carmella was distracted by Corey Graves at ringside, causing her to fail her to aid her tag partner in the win. So it appears as if this is just leading to a a Queen Zelina and Carmella split at WrestleMania. They're going to drop the belts pr- probably to uh, one of the other two or three teams that are in this match. I mean, well, they have to. Uh, I just don't know which team yet. I'll have to see what the final card is. 
and it's, it's it's just leading to a split. They're going to go off on their own, and that's that. And uh, then we'll be back, back to what two or three teams in the t- women's tag division. Yeah. So uh, it, it, I don't know what to make of this. I mean, so Liv Morgan gets a victory, which is which is a positive, but it's a victory that unfortunately doesn't mean a whole lot at this point. Uh, so all right, the Mysterios defeat the Hurt Business as if the Hurt Business have ever gotten a victory in the last year. Uh, when Dominic hit Cedric with a frog splash, Logan Paul and Miz were on commentary for the match and tried to attack the Mysterios after their win, but were easily run off. So, you know, Logan Paul, I got to say, I mean, he, he could probably be a, a WWE superstar. I mean, not just in the the brand of that, but actually be a superstar, not just saying the, you know, not just replacing the word wrestler with superstar because Vince feels like it's a better way to label them, but really, truly, the, the, the real sense of the word. I mean, he's not. He's just a a, a fill in. He's he's essentially just appropriating the the wrestler role at this point. But I, I mean, on commentary, he's not. He's kind of awkward, and he feels like he's out of his element because he is. And it's weird to say that because he has tens of millions of followers, which is why they're bringing him in. By the way. He is a social media star. He has his own podcast. He seems very comfortable in front of the camera. But on commentary, it's like he he's like a deer in the headlights. He doesn't know what to say or do. And maybe he's hesitant, fearful. I don't know what it is, but it's interesting. You know, a guy that has done so much and is so popular in social media and has done so many on camera things is just so out, out of his element, which always makes celebrities on the show awkward. Um, and so anyway, you know, he, he ended up getting run out of the ring just as the Mysterios, Ray and Dominic were about to deliver the double six one nine. Um, and that was that. I, I think ultimately what's going to happen here is probably Logan Paul turns on the Miz at WrestleMania turning quote unquote baby face. And I, I would think they're going to try to maybe turn him baby face. I don't think it's going to work because the crowd, it's e- the, the guy is easily dislikable. I mean, he, he's got this kind of arrogance about him. People hate success anyway, right? And, and, I mean, let, let's admit it. If, if somebody's super successful and you're, you, you've got a little bit of jealousy in your heart about it, people dislike that, I think, um, regardless of whether people admit it or not. He is. He's, he's got a, a bit of a checkered past. If you look into Logan Paul, he, he's not the most um, sensitive guy. He's got a little bit of some issues that had happened with him in the past. I mean, so he, he's not a likable dude. And so I think that... Uh, this is the right role, putting him in the heel heel role. Number one. I, so I'm glad they put him in a heel role, not in a role that celebrities traditionally take in at WrestleMania where Vince tries to get you to cheer for them. And so, uh, you know, this was fine. I mean, the match itself with the Mysterios and hurt business, it was just, it was okay. It was fine. Um, the, you knew the hurt business were going to lose. You knew they were going to lose because the hurt business haven't, they haven't won a match, much less gotten any mic time in like a year. Um, you know, trying to consistently get back with Bobby Lashley and all that. So eh, it was it was okay. I mean, I'm, this isn't exactly a match that's going to sell tickets at WrestleMania. I gotta say. All right, then Edge cut a promo on again AJ Styles and Edge. Man, God, you talk about somebody being able to reinvent themselves on like uh, uh, the drop of a hat. Uh, Edge is freaking masterful, and they didn't wait to change his music. Maybe Edge was proactive in this i would imagine he saw this coming and they, they, it wasn't just a weekly decision that he knew that this was a heel turn coming down the line and he had time to prepare and figure out what he's going to wear and his music usually music as i said lags behind the turn sometimes there's like a month or two before the music catches up and oftentimes they don't change the music because they know the heel run's not going to last so why invest time in the music if they're just going to go back to babyface anyway but edge changed his music it's this dark kind of like darker it's a darker uh tone to the music as well as at the beginning he says you think you know me you never did i mean it's, it's good stuff great stuff the the walk to the ring the very very dark just evil kind of overtones is great stuff it's not brood it's not the ultimate opportunist we saw in the mid 2000s it's just it's a different version and i really love this i, I mean i got i've got to say and if you're looking at summar- summarizing this character, I would say it's arrogance, entitlement, um, better than you, and he's standing on the mountain of omnipotence using bigger words to annoy people. I mean, I, I, I really like this character. The crowd is also reacting appropriately, so that's how you know you've got them. They're reacting appropriately where they're not just cheering, saying, wow, this is a cool version of Edge. You're not hearing that. That's a testament to Edge 
executing this perfectly as well as creative maybe there was some creative minds and vents or whoever give credit where it's due whoever is responsible for this needs to get credit for it i think majority is to edge adam copeland but perhaps there are others involved and i got to give everybody credit for it because i really like this and um here, edge said that oh here, here's the other kind of uh, overtone which was great he vowed that styles would be quote unquote judged should Styles make it to Mania for a match. So he's not only on, on this mountain of omnipotence, but he's now passing judgment on people. I mean, that, that's such a great thing to take from real life where all of us, if you if you know somebody that has the quality of judgment, where you know you just feel like you're being judged by somebody, isn't that an awful trait? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very unlikable trait to have. And so if you take that a super unlikable trait and you put it into a, a wrestling character, where he says he's going to judge people, man. I mean, I, I don't even know if anyone's ever done that. That's great. Edge, Edge is God. He's good. Um, I think eventually, look, I'll say this: this heel character is not going to last forever. I think before Edge truly calls it a career, he will turn back to the baby face and then finally ride off forever into the sunset and end it that way. So I think he's, this heel character is probably going to last six months to a year, maybe ending completely at next year's WrestleMania where he turns back to babyface and he has his final match at uh, WrestleMania 39 next year. That's my guess. He'll want to end it on a high note with his, you know, the most beloved version of himself with the rated R superstar and with his uh, music that eventually comes back to babyface music. That's my guess. But this, if, if this is successful, and I think it will be, I think it's a six to 12 month run as a heel. It's, it, and plus, Edge isn't there every week. You know, Edge isn't there every week, and that makes it more special, and he can run this character out longer. It doesn't get drawn out week after week after week. He takes, like, month, two months off at a time. And maybe he does that after WrestleMania, and you don't see him again until May or, or June. You know, it's so... I have nothing but A-plus a to say for this segment, and uh, love it. Okay, Bianca Belair defeats Dewdrop via pinfall after hitting KOD. After the match, Becky Lynch attacked Belair, pulling her from the ring, throwing her into the ring steps to announce... Uh, and announce table before putting Belair's head in a steel chair and ramming it into the ring post. I have no problem with this at all. Um, well, first of all, the match between Bianca and Dewdrop. Can we move on from this rivalry? I mean, it is fun to see her hit the KOD on Dewdrop. And the first time she did it, she got a massive reaction. But then the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time, it's like, okay, like cool. But you're, you're, you're kind of, I don't know. It feels like she's on a bit of a, a treadmill and they don't know who else to pair with her. And they're also trying to make her look as strong as possible. I get that. But I feel like they're running out of tread on the tire of Bianca and Dewdrop. Uh, can we, I mean, I just, can we please move on from this? I, I think they will, because now there's two weeks left. There's not a whole lot of TV left to write before the match. I think they can come up with some decent stuff without having her face Dewdrop again and again and again. Uh, but I, again, I'm not, I'm not really complaining about it. I'm just kind of ready to move on from that rivalry. Um, and I know it's a setup to help just establish her but still becky again attacking B uh, bianca was fun and it, it was it was nice to see some just absolute brutality on the on the side of becky not just screaming and being a, a, a cowardly heel but rather showing aggression and ruthlessness and what she did putting bianca Belair's head in a steel chair and ramming it at the post i don't think i've seen that before i don't that that particular spot if i have it i can't recall when i think it was very well done I really like this and Becky screaming at Bianca and uh, I th I still believe that she will somehow try to make the case to management that her hair is going to be banned from use as an, a, a weapon in the match. And if she uses her hair, she'll be disqualified and, and uh, lose the match. I still believe that she'll probably go that road. You know, we'll see, but this was good. The only one nitpick, cause I always have to is Bianca Belair was selling her throat being, uh, damage during this, but it took her like five seconds to sell it. It should have been instant, right? Like she rammed her, f her head into the ring post and then it was like a delay. She just laid there knocked out. And then she thought to herself, Oh crap, that's right. I got to sell. I got to sell the, the throat. That's going to be the selling point. Crap. I forgot to do that. I got to do that quick. It's almost like she had that thought process. I mean, maybe it was on purpose. Maybe it wasn't. It was like, it was a very delayed reaction where she suddenly just realized, oh, crap, I got to sell my throat. <laughs> so I, I didn't hate it. Again, I'm not ranting about it. I'm not, I'm not you know, hating, on, uh, hating on it at all. 
it still was a very effective segment and it made you even more interested to see how is Bianca going to react? Is she going to be able to make it to WrestleMania? Of course, the answer is always yes. You know, how, what is the reaction from Bianca? Does she does she try to attack Becky next week? Is she able to be there next week? All that stuff. And it upped the aggression. It upped the ante. It, 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 it increased the heat, so to speak, in a way that made you want to see this match more. So, hey, mission accomplished when it comes to this segment, I believe. Riddle versus Montez Ford ended in a no contest after interference from Alpha Academy. A Street Profits interrupted RK Bros Championship celebration, demanding a title match at WrestleMania because they defeat the champ. They defeated the champions shortly before they won the titles. Randy Orton refused the challenge, but Riddle said they had to face someone and convinced Orton to accept. The Profits then made fun of the celebration, which was put on by Orton and featured concession popcorn and gum, leading Riddle to challenge Ford to a singles match. During the match, Alpha Academy attacked all members of RK Bro and the Prophets, leading to and uh, leading to the end of the match. So, while I said that Randy Orton did refuse this matchup with the uh, Street Profits for WrestleMania, eventually, you know, th- they accepted. And I think Alpha Academy is also going to be involved in this. It's going to be a triple threat. I mean, how can it not be? That's what this is, and I I totally agree. You can't leave the most overachieving tag team of 2022 so far out of WrestleMania. To me, Alpha Academy, it, it, they're, they're so much fun. And 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 uh, Otis doesn't talk a lot, but he plays his monster role well. Obviously, the straw that stirs the drink here is uh, is Chad Gable. Chad Gable is right now on the, the the ride of his career with T-shirts being made and shoosh and all that. And and, and a thank you. All, all of that is it, oh, it's good stuff. So I believe it's going to be triple threat. How can it not be? How can it not be? So Riddle versus Montez for the match itself, though. What do you expect? These two are just superhuman athletic. I mean, especially Montez Ford, who's got, I mean, he's like go, go gadget legs. I mean, he is just, I don't even know how you, you, you're built that way as a human being with the things that he can do. Riddle in his own right is incredibly athletic, but Montez Ford is, is even a level above that in certain aspects. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I really, I really do believe and will continue to believe that Montez Ford is a future WWE champion or, or whatever this belt that they're unifying is going to be. I really believe that. And when, when the Street Profits break up, that is what Montez Ford should aspire to is, uh, is, is yeah, the IC or US title. But quickly, I think he could go right into the WWE title picture. He could sell his ass off. He is good on the microphone. He is a, he is an established star as a tag as an accomplished tag team wrestler, so he's got that foundation. the The fans love him. Uh, he's got a presence, and he's insanely good in the ring in terms just athleticism, the, the how high he can jump, all that. I mean, he's got all the tools. So I'm looking forward to whatever they do with Montez Ford whenever they decide to break them up, which I don't think is ready. It's not ready yet. That whole team uh, isn't ready to break up yet. I don't think they've got they got everything out of the Street Profits that they could yet. So. Uh, I think I covered everything here from Monday Night Raw. I don't know if I missed anything. If I did, my bad. But um, thank you for everybody for listening here. I know that, uh, what are we at here? 38 minutes or so. Eh, I'm a little bit short from normal. Usually these go like 45 minutes to an hour, but I'm going doing as best I can here, guys. Um, as I said, I'm traveling over the next few days. I'll be in Florida for no reason other than to sit on a beach, drink, and relax. <laughs> That's it. I, I could have lied to you and said it's for business, and then that would have made me sound more professional. But in lieu of that, I've decided to be straightforward and, uh, and and immature with you, and just say that's the reason I'm going. I haven't had a vacation in years, so. But hey, for those of you thinking out there, wait, that's not that's not fair to your wife. You have two kids at home. Guess what? She has her own vacation coming up in July. So tit for tat, I'm not that guy that's like, well, oh, I can do this and you can't do that, right? So anyway, uh, as you guys pass judgment on me and uh, turn heel. I get that. But all right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. As always, you can join us ad free on Patreon. It's a dollar, a dollar an Apple podcast. That's not going to last long. And also on our website, use the code, the promo code WrestleMania to get 50% off your first month and join us for video updates there as well. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us here on the WWE podcast. I'll be back later today because today's Wednesday. I'll be back later today with the mailbag show. And as always, take care. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. 
so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.